Thank you for joining us for Islam and Christianity and Bible Prophecy Seminars. In this presentation, we're looking at presentation number five, the role of Islam in the growing conflict. Let me just give a brief overview in case you're seeing this without seeing the first four presentations. In the book of Daniel, there is a series a, of nations that invade Israel from the north. In Daniel 2 and 7, it begins with Babylon, who Jeremiah said would invade from the north. Even though the capital is to the east, they invaded from the north. Then in Daniel 11, 2 and following, it starts out with Medo-Persia, and they follow the same direction of invasion or occupation as the Babylonians did, and they come in from the north into Israel and Jerusalem. Jeremiah called them an assembly of great nations from the north. Then the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great comes in from the north, and the Greek Empire then divides four ways, but Daniel cares about two of them, north and south, Seleucid north, Ptolemy south, and Jerusalem got caught in the middle. Then the Roman Empire under Pompey comes in from the north, and they take over basically the whole Middle Eastern area, and following the Roman Empire, it divides in the ten or so ways, and again, Daniel only cares about two, Christian North, Islamic South. And in presentation two, we identify that the leader of the Christian side is the papacy who called for the Crusades and they struck back at Islam from the North. There are three conflicts in Daniel 11 after the time of Christ. So in verses 23 and following, we have Arab Islam and the Crusades, Ottoman Islam, and the time of the end, radical Islam. Some people ask me, hey Tim, are the Muslims and the Christians worshiping the same God? Well, the Bible says that God's true followers would love their enemies and do good to those who despitefully use them. So the point is that when you look at Islam and Christianity, say the Crusades, was it the Islamist, uh, Jihadist, or the Crusaders that were really loving their enemies and do doing good to the other side? And the obvious answer is neither. And so I come to the simple conclusion there are many Muslims and many Christians who are worshiping the same false god of force, fear, and anger. Do it our way or else. While there are some Christians and some Muslims who have found or are in search of the same true god of love, truth, peace, and forgiveness. And in Daniel 11, in this presentation, we will show you how that works out, how God has a group of Muslims and a group of Christians who will come together to truly follow him. Now, there are some definitions you need to know. Caliphate. Uh, a caliphate is ruled by a caliph who claims global geopolitical and global religious power, church and state. You also have a pope or a papacy. It's ruled by a pope who claims global geopolitical power and global religious power. And in both cases, we have a church-state combination and God's people tend to get caught in the middle whenever that happens. In the caliphate, um, the caliphate people that are supporting caliphates are Islamist. And so when you hear the term Islamist, these are the radical Muslims who want to bring about a global caliphate by force, and they want to establish the capital of that global caliphate in the city they call Al-Quds, otherwise known as Jerusalem. And Islamists include the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Erdogan of Turkey, Iran, and others. These are all people who want to set up a caliphate in Jerusalem as the global capital and make the whole world follow Islam. Now we have moderates, not just Islamists, the moderates within the Muslim world are those who are opposed to a caliphate by force in Jerusalem, and they include Saudi Arabia, and those who have signed the Abrahamic Accords, which include United Arab Emirates, Sudan, Bahrain, Morocco, and Oman. And there are several others that are probably considering joining in the very near future. So, what is the role of Islam in Daniel 11? Well, we're going to start out by looking at the time of the end conflict, our time, and then we'll go back and look at what they've already done. In Daniel 11, verses 40 to 43, it says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, 
and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So we have a king of the north and a king of the south in conflict. And when the king of the south goes down, it names Egypt, Edom, Moab, Ammon, that's western Jordan. And it names Libya and Ethiopia. These are Muslim areas of influence. So when the king of the south goes down, it's clearly Muslim in Daniel chapter 11. So we have this conflict, and let me describe for a moment how it works. You have Islam that starts down here in Mecca and Medina, and it comes up and hits Israel and Jerusalem from the south. It takes over this whole North Africa area, and then during the Crusades, the Pope calls for holy war and gets the Crusades, and the Christian forces come down from the north and attack uh, and take Jerusalem from the north. So Islam begins this force in 634 and the push, uh, four armies came up out of, from Mecca and Medina at that time. Now if you take a look at the map now, you see that we have this area in red and this whole area in red is what they consider their territory. And it's still predominantly to the south of Israel to this day and Jerusalem. Meanwhile, we have up here the Christian nations that followed the papal-led Christianity and they're still predominantly north. We have Turkey right in here and it's striped. I call it somewhat schizophrenic because it's politically aligned with the Christian nations of Europe. It's religiously aligned with the nations of Islam. Charles Malik, president of the United Nations General Assembly, he was ambassador to the United States from Lebanon, was lecturing at Harvard and he said the following, the only hope for the Western world lies in an alliance between the Roman Catholic Church, which is most commonly influential controlling unifying element in Europe, and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Rome must unite with Eastern Orthodoxy because the Eastern Orthodox Church controls the Western Middle East. And if they don't solidify that control, Islam will march across Europe. Islam is political. The only hope of a Western world lies then in a united Europe under the control of the Pope. So what do we have here? We have a world politician in the 1970s realizing that Islam was on the march and it was going to be a church-state union. It wasn't just a religion, it was also political. And he said the only way to stop it is if the Christians organize against it. And he went on to be more clear on that. And then all Protestant Christians around the globe must come into submission to the Pope. So we will have a unified Christian world. And in presentation three, we mentioned that all the world would follow papal-led Christianity, the beast power of Revelation 13, verse three. Now, in presentation two, we pointed out that there were 15 characteristics and the papal, papal system identified or fulfilled all those characteristics of being the king of the north, little horn, man of sin, beast power. We noted that the papacy would come from the, northern, from the Roman Empire, but it comes from the northern part of the empire. Islam comes from the southern part. They both have a, head at the, a man at the head. You have the pope for the papal system. You have a caliph for the Muslims. And so both have a leader that is both religious and political. It would speak great words. New Testament calls it Antichrist. Antichrist can mean either in place of Christ or against Christ. And the king of the north puts himself in place of Christ. And Islam denies the divinity of Christ. Thus, both of them are in the terms of Antichrist. They both persecute the saints. During the time of the Inquisition and the Crusades, the papacy, uh, the Crusaders, they killed Muslims. Jews and Christians who differed with them. During the same time period, the Muslims killed Christians, Jews, and Muslims who differed with them. Very similar, but God's people of faith tend to get caught in the middle. The papacy re receives the dragon seat or capital, which was the city of Rome. And to this day, they have Rome. Meanwhile, uh, the king of the south ends up getting Constantinople, which was the second capital of the Roman Empire, now known as Istanbul. 
There are time prophecies for both. In Revelation 13, 5, it tells us that the beast, the papal system, or king of the north from Daniel 11, would be in power for 1260 days or years. Well, in Revelation 9, Islam, uh, Arab Islam, 9, 5, would be in power for 150 years, while Turkish power would be there for 391 years and 15 days. There was actually a guy by the name of Josiah Litch who predicted that the Ottoman Empire would fall on August 11, 1840. And he did that about a year ahead of time. And then, on August 11, 1840, in the events that happened in Turkey, Lebanon, and Egypt, the Ottoman Empire became a protectorate or a subservient to the European empires. And in Bible prophecy, whenever a power becomes subservient to others, it's no longer in the superpower category, which should be an obvious point. Now, in Revelation 1, it said, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. In Daniel 11, we have three conflicts between the king of the north and the king of the south. And Islam, in Revelation 9 and following, has three woes. So, three conflicts, three woes. We're talking the same thing. Both are Islam versus papal-led Christianity. So we take a look at our screen here for a moment, and we see that this area in red is the first phase or first row area conquered by Islam. They were not able to take Constantinople right up in here because um, the Eastern Orthodox powers were still a little too strong for them. But they spread over that area during the first 150 years, and then the, they began the decline in power, and the Crusades hit them. And then comes the second one, or the appointed time, and we find it in verses 29 to 39. It's the time of the Reformation and the Ottoman Islamic Empire. It says, At the appointed time he shall return and go towards the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter. The former's the Crusades, the latter's the time of the end, and the appointed time is the time right there uh, during the Ottoman Empire. Now, you can go to our website and download a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Daniel 11, and you get more detail than what I'm doing right now, but I'm just kind of covering the high points and to explain the time of the end conflict right now. We have on our website as well uh, a, a presentation called The Times of Daniel 11 and 12. And the appointed time is a time period that is bounded by time prophecies. In Daniel 12, there's a time prophecy that from the abomination of desolation until uh, there will be 1290 and 1335. But there are two abominations of desolation in Daniel's writings. The first is the fall of Jerusalem, and you come 1290 years later, it brings you to the beginning of Wycliffe's work. 1335 brings you to when John Huss becomes the first practicing reformer. And so that's 1360 and 1405. And from 1360 to 1405, you have the rise of the Reformation. You also have the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Daniel 1131 is the second abomination of desolation, of abomination. That's when the papacy gets the force of arms. That happens when the French Clovis king starts giving power, I mean, is baptized and starts fighting against the enemies of the papacy. And so that's 508. And from 508, 1290 brings us to 1798 when the papacy lost the ability to have political persecuting power. And 1335 brings us down to the time of the end. And so what we have here on this chart is you have the introduction right here to the Reformation and the Ottoman Empire. They're both strong through this time period. And between 1798 and 1843, they fall in power. And so we have the rise and fall of the Ottomans and the Reformation uh, between these white lines called the appointed time. Before it is the Crusades, after it is the time of the end. And so by setting up the prophecy and the timelines bookends, it works out very clearly. But in verse 29, it said he was going to return towards the south, but it would not be like the former or the latter. Why? 
It's very specific. For ships from Cyprus shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return in rage against the holy covenants and do damage. So he shall return and shall regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. So here's what happens. We have, um, this is the second woe during the time of the Ottomans. And right here there's the island of the Cyprus. And the Turks wanted to take that island from the Christians. And so they were working on taking it. And the Pope over here doesn't like it. And so he calls for the Holy League. And they put together around 300 ships. But the Muslims had a head start on them. They dropped off thousands of troops on the islands. And their troops headed, their ships headed west. The ships were to, would meet right over in here in the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. It was one of the largest naval engagements up to that time. And in just a few hours, well over 50,000 men died. And uh, the Muslim fleet was decimated, but the Christian fleet had to go back home because it was damaged, and the Muslims held Cyprus. But the real thing is, that fleet from the Christian fleet was to head down to Cyprus, retake it, and go to Jerusalem. But they didn't make it, because the prophecy said they would be stopped by ships from Cyprus, and the ships that stopped them had just come from Cyprus. So... That's very interesting. Here in 1571 is a painting that was made at the Vatican to celebrate the victory of the Battle of Lepanto. Obviously, you can tell that the Muslims are here on the left, uh, right there. But it said that he would be stopped and return in rage against the Holy Covenant. The very next year, in 1572, uh, this painting was commissioned, at, this and another one, at the Vatican, and... It's celebrating the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre when over 70,000 French Huguenots were killed by the Catholics. And so the prophecy is he's going to head south, he's going to be stopped, he's going to return home and fight against the covenant, and that's exactly what happens, and the paintings in the Vatican attest to it to this day. So why did God allow these Islamic invasions? Well, Revelation 9 and Verses 20 and 21 tell us, But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Okay. In Old Testament times, what happens when somebody starts when the children of Israel start worshiping idols do they gain or lose protection from God obviously the answer is they lose it and in this case when the New Testament believers of God the Christians start worshiping idols meaning putting up images etc they lose protection but somebody says oh but the Catholics and others that have images they're not really worshiping their images they're worshiping what they represent well you read the story of the golden calf it's the same thing. They said they were worshiping the true God that was represented by the calf, and God didn't appreciate that either. He says not to bow down before images. And so when you start bowing down before images, you lose protection, and in come the Muslims. And what do the Muslims especially hate? Image worship. Also, we find out that the king of the north, or in Revelation 13, it's called the, little, uh, the beast, would receive a deadly wound but come back with great power, and so here's just a graph, a power uh, curve, I call it, of the papal power. 13, 1260 years of supremacy. Then 1929, they come back and they hit their highest point of power of all time. And then they come to their crashing end when uh, Jesus returns. And so I superimposed over it the Islamic power curve. And I was amazed. You have the first one, and then the Crusades, then the second one, the Ottomans, and you have that same general shape. They're both down for a little while, and then Islam in 1929 starts its resurgence, I mean 1948 starts its resurgence. Why? Because Israel becomes their common enemy. And they stopped fighting with each other quite so much and united to fight against Israel. And then they got oil and oil money, and many of the radicals discovered terrorism. And with that combination, they seem to be one of the greatest threats that is known to our civilization right now. Now, we're looking at some end-time allies as well. And we have 
in Revelation 13, which is presentation three in our presentation, uh, we have the United States rising to support the King of the North. That's Revelation 13. And Revelation 11, we have the French Revolution with Marxist socialism supporting the King of the South. They both come in around about the time of the deadly wound, 1798, and grow powerful by the time we hit the end of the close of the second woe, which is in the 1840s. And so in that time period, these powers are all arising. People ask, could it really happen that we could have this conflict between papal-led Christianity and Islam? Well, folks, if you don't know it could happen, you haven't been watching that it is happening. It's already happening. You see, we have some viewpoints that are already out there. Sunni Muslims believe there'll be a war in Syria. It will bring chaos. And out of the chaos, God will cause the world to follow Islam and they will set up their world capital in El Quds, otherwise known as Jerusalem. And Jesus will take on a Dajjal, which is some kind of an antichrist type character. Meanwhile, the Shiites, another form of Islam, they believe there will be a war in Syria. There will be a 12th Imam that will lead against uh, the rest of the world and that will unify the world to become Muslim. And they will set up the world capital in Al Quds, known as Jerusalem. And Jesus will defend them against the Dajjal. So all of this is a similarity, but notice they all believe they will get Jerusalem and conquer the world. Well, the Pope thinks he's going to have control of the world too, so there's not room for both the Pope and the Caliph, the King of the South, at the same time. Uh, Muhammad Badia, the Muslim Brotherhood Supreme Guide, confirmed the necessity for every Muslim to strive to save Al Quds from the hands of the rapist and that's Israel to them, and to cleanse Palestine from the clutches of the occupation, deeming this an individual duty for all Muslims. So it's very clear that they are out to do this. Also, in Iran, the Shiites, we have this. A high Iranian politician believes the Syrian revolution could be the catalyst for sparking a worldwide conflagration that will usher in an era of Muslim domination of the world. We also have prophecies of Mary that predict an Islamic antichrist uh, that will be coming. Many evangelicals and talk show hosts are now teaching that the antichrist will be Muslim. Wally Chubat, Joel Richardson, Joel Rosenberg, and many others. Uh, Glenn Beck has done it in a m movie that he had out, Rumors of War II, a uh, video production that his uh, group put out. So yes, this is likely to happen. And when it does, uh, I say likely, many people around the world are seeing it as likely. The Bible, I believe, says it will happen. And when it does, the king of the north will attack Islam, enter Israel, and Islam will be divided three ways. Let's read it again, just to come back to the time of the end conflict. This is God's word being fulfilled right now. This is where we're living. At the time of the end, the king of the south, Islam, shall attack him. So Islam and their allies attack the papacy and their allies. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. So one part escapes, Edo, Moab, and Ammon, Western Jordan. Another part, Egypt and many countries are overthrown and a third part follow after the king of the north. In Revelation, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So it's the same ideas and the same flow of the prophecy in history. So let's take a look for a moment at a map. We have Egypt over here. Egypt has been relatively stable since the days of Daniel uh, in its territory. And so Egypt, it says, would be overthrown. Egypt in many countries. Well, in presentation four, we found that Israel is both the land of Israel, but it's also God's people worldwide that have trusted in Jesus and follow the Bible. Well, that would mean Egypt is both the land of Egypt, but it's globally 
all those who are following the same pattern of radical Islam. Meanwhile, Libya and Ethiopia are um, the moderate Muslims. I expect that Libya and Ethiopia will follow the King of the North. And when we say Libya, I'm talking all of North Africa. Libya, Ethiopia is the whole area that includes Sudan, uh, Somalia, Ethiopia, all that territory down through there. And so Libya and Ethiopia, they follow the King of the North. And Egypt in many countries are overthrown. So the radicals are overthrown and the moderates follow papal-led Christianity. We're going to come back to those who escape later because it's the really good news. And we want to end with that. So how would this happen, this attack and the papal response? In 2011, I wrote a book on Daniel 11, Islam and Christianity and Prophecy, and I gave my expectations. I believed that radical Islam would anger the Pope, the papacy would call for war against Islam, the United States and its allies would become the military enforcer for the papal system, radical Islam would be overthrown, moderate Islam would po follow papal-led Christianity, and some Muslims and some Christians would follow Jesus in the Bible. So I had these six expectations in 2011. And in 2014, they began to happen in sequence. Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed leader of the Islamic State stretching across Iraq and Syria, has vowed to lead the conquest of Rome as he called on Muslims to immigrate to his new land to fight under its banner around the globe. I didn't realize that on day one, they would be so clear that it is a conquest of Rome, that the papacy was their target, and that they would be out to conquer the world. And so on the very beginning of the Islamic State, they made it clear they're pushing against the king of the north. The question was, how long would it take the Pope to call for war? It only took five and a half weeks when Pope Francis appealed to world leaders on Thursday to help end the crisis in northern Iraq after a sweeping advance by radical Islamic state militants forced thousands of residents of Iraq's biggest Christian town to flee their homes. His Holiness addresses an urgent appeal to the international community to take action to end the humanitarian tragedy now underway. So five and a half weeks after the King of the South, the Islamic State says they're coming after the Pope and they're setting up their Islamic State, first functioning caliphate since the Ottoman Empire, the Pope calls for military action against them. This should be a fulfillment of Daniel 11. The very next day, Obama, the President of the United States, says America is coming to help. And within 36 hours of the papal call for action, the United States attacks the Islamic State for the first time, which makes them the enforcer for the beast papal system. Six days after the Pope's call for action, some of the media was saying, oh, the Pope didn't really mean military action. He must have meant humanitarian action. I mean, he's the man of peace, not the man of war. And so the Pope sends out his ambassador, the Holy See's ambassador to the United Nations, Savano Tomasi, this weekend, supports U.S. airstrikes aimed at halting the advance of Sunni Islamic State militants, calling for intervention now before it's too late. While the Vatican vocally disapproved of the U.S.-led campaign in Iraq in 2003 and the 2013 plan for airstrikes on Syria, fearing both might make the situation worse for Christians on the ground, fears of ethnic cleansing by Islamists has forced a policy change. In Daniel 11, it says the king of the south will push against the king of the north and the king of the north will come back on him. That's exactly what they just admitted here. It was the Islamists, the king of the south people, who had pushed and forced the change in the papacy. Then, the Islamic State made it clear what has been declared by the self-declared Islamic State is clear. They want to kill the Pope. The threats against the Pope are credible. And there have been multiple times that they have called for the assassination of the Pope. Why would they want to do that? Because they want to trigger a holy war between Islam and Christianity. And if you kill the Pope, you're likely to trigger that kind of holy war. Then, Jihadi John calls Obama the dog of Rome. Why would he do that? Well, the Pope said sick him and the U.S. bit. And so from that time on, the United States and its leaders were considered the dog or dogs of Rome. Pope comes up with an interesting statement. And you may notice that these stories are basically in date order. He said that it's wrong to equate Islam with violence. Pope Francis said that equating Islam with violence was wrong and called on Muslim leaders to issue a global condemnation of terrorism. To help dispel the stereotype, you just can't say all Muslims are terrorists. 
Just as you can't say that all Christians are fundamentalist, we have our share of them fundamentalist. All religions have these little groups. Now take a close look at what the Pope just said. The prophecy said that part of the King of the South, Libya and Ethiopia, the moderate Muslims would follow him. So you have to expect that the Pope is out wooing the moderate Muslims to follow him, which is exactly what he's going, doing right here. But he says there are a problematic group, these fundamentalist Muslims, and he's already called for military action against them. But then he admits there are fundamentalist Christians too. We all have our share of them, fundamentalist. Oh, during the time of the Reformation and the Inquisition, what did they call the fundamentalists? They called them heretics. If they were following the Bible instead of the traditions of the church, they were fundamentalists and needed to be killed. So he's already approved the killing of the radicals, and now he's admitting there's a time coming that he might have to go after the fundamentalists, the Christians following Jesus in the Bible that are serious about it. And in Daniel 11, after taking down the king of the south, we'll see he goes after the true followers of Jesus. Then in 2015, there was a terror attack in France, Charlie Hebdo incident, where Charlie Hebdo satire magazine had uh, printed some cartoons of Muhammad and a couple of Muslims showed up and killed a bunch of people there and then a firefight in a Jewish deli, and I think it was 17 people died. And then within 48 hours of that event, we had, in Paris, France, we have a historic crowd of more than a million people, including more than 40 world leaders, jammed the streets on Sunday. Leaders often at odds, such as Ukrainian president and Russian foreign minister, Israeli Netanyahu, and Palestinian Mahmoud Abbas. Wow, we have world leaders that don't really like each other, coming together and protesting against terrorism, especially radical Islamic terrorism that had just happened there. But what's amazing to me is though a majority of people that I meet still remember the Charlie Hebdo incident, most of them are not aware of another terrorist activity that happened within a few days of this where, over, where somewhere around 2,000 people were killed. It's funny, I mean sad actually, it is sad that people remember 17 and forget 2000. That's almost like a, another 9-11 World Trade Center bombing. It was in Nigeria. Nigeria says the number of people who lost their lives in an assault by Boko Haram militants on the town of Baga last week was no more than 150. The defense ministry said this figure included many of the terrorists who had attacked the town in Borno State and faced resistance by troops. Local officials earlier estimated the number of deaths as many as 2,000. Nigeria has often been accused of underestimating casualty figures to downplay the threat of Boko Haram. And so I've been in northern Nigeria uh, just before this, and I knew the president there was good luck Jonathan, but his luck ran out with this one. They got so mad because of the attempt to hide this attack, which around 2,000 people were killed, that they voted him out of office. So the amazing thing is, though, people remember the 17, but f never even heard of or forgot about the 2,000. Why would that be? Because the 17 that were killed were media types, so the media cares about that. But the 2,000 that are killed, well, they're just... Uh, African Christians and unfortunately our media doesn't seem to care that much about African Christians uh, Christians in general but especially African Christians then we find that the Pope goes to the United Nations in September of 2015 and when he does um, he gets the press coverage Putin is there and Obama were there but the pre Pope gets the pr press coverage which indicates to me that as far as the world is concerned, the Pope is the important player. Now, the Huffington Post writes this article, but shrewdly, methodically, and with the showman's flair, the soft-spoken 70-year-old Argentinian Jesuit priest named Pope Francis showed Thursday that he is running to become president of the planet. And so, Huffington Post is ready to endorse him. And the real truth is, during the Crusades, the world especially the Christian world, turned to the Pope 
because they were afraid of a violent form of Islam. During the Ottomans, they were afraid of a violent form of Islam and they turned to the Pope. And now at the time of the end, we have a violent form of Islam rearing back up and the papacy has stood up against it and the world is once again coming back to follow the papacy. At the time of the end in Revelation, it says the whole world follows him and it tells us why in, Re in Daniel 11, it's because of Islam. We have a story about mass immigration crisis and it might get worse. I don't think this wave can stop, said Sonia Licht of the International Center for Democratic Transition. The global north must be prepared that the global south is on the move, the entire global south. This is not just a problem for Europe, but for the whole world. And so we have an Islamic push and a push from the south immigration-wise coming from the south. Terrorism and immigration. And across Europe and the Western world, the birth rates are plummeting and the Muslim world, it's high. And just a numerical count is the Western cultures, the traditional Christian cultures are in danger of being overcome just by the birth push. Then in 2016, Trump was running for office and he said, the point is they, radical Islam, want to do serious harm. We have to take them out. We have to take them out very, very swiftly and viciously if necessary. We have got to destroy the brand of jihad. And he went out to destroy and annihilate them, basically. Like a whirlwind in Daniel 11. He didn't make it. He thought he would, but he didn't make it. And what I think we've seen here is we've seen kind of a down payment or what God is going to, what we're going to see that God allowed us to get a glimpse of it beforehand, that we're going to see all this again as it intensifies. During his inauguration, Trump said, we will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. And based on Daniel, and for years I've been saying that eventually the king of the north wipes out radical Islam, Egypt, and many countries. And so this is fully what I expect to see. He thought he was going to make it, but again, as I said, he did not. But I will tell you, he doubled the number of bombs and missiles hitting the Islamic State, and he, was, and he did take away their ability to hold territory. But that did not take them out. It metastasized all over the world, and Africa is being decimated by the Islamic State at this time. And they even attack in Israel and other places. Where did Trump go on his first foreign trip? He stopped in Saudi Arabia, where the King of the South comes from. He stopped in Israel, the one caught in the middle, and the Vatican, where the King of the North comes from. He said the visit to Saudi Arabia will include a truly historic gathering in Saudi Arabia with leaders from all across the Muslim world. We will begin to construct a new foundation of cooperation and support with our Muslim allies to combat extremism, terrorism, and violence. And that is played out in the Abrahamic Accords today. That Muslim nations that are the moderate ones are joining with Israel because they're afraid of the radicals that are the Islamists that want to caliphate by force in Jerusalem. Then President Donald Trump announced that the U.S. would officially recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital and move its embassy there. Within a week, less than a week, there is a group meeting in uh, Turkey that are opposed to Trump's order to move the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Soleimani, which is commander of the Al-Quds Force, says his nation is ready to support Palestinian forces in Gaza Strip days after the U.S. recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Now, Soleimani is commander of the Iranian Al-Quds Force. Now, Al-Quds, remember, is the n Muslim name for Jerusalem. But you take a close look at this, and you have Al-Quds up here, and you have Jerusalem down there. I have them highlighted. In this paragraph, there is nothing to indicate that they're one in the same place. And over and over in the media, you will find that they'll talk about Al-Quds, they'll talk about Jerusalem, they will not tell you it's the same place. Why? Because if you knew it was the same place, you'd, you would realize what's really at stake here. And I don't think they want you to understand it. Uh, because left-leaning, political-leaning people often are protecting radical Islam. And we'll show you, I'll show you that in another presentation. But then the Saudi prince came out and showed who um, is who's a radical and who's a moderate. 
Saudi Arabia's powerful Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has described Turkey as part of a triangle of evil along with Iran and hardline Islamist groups. The Saudi prince also accused Turkey of trying to reinstate the Islamic Caliphate, abolished nearly a century ago when the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Continuing now in the Atlantic on the same subject, he says, in this triangle, they are trying to promote the idea that our duty as Muslims is to reestablish the caliphate, that the glory of Islam is in holding an em building an empire by force. We have no duty anymore to fight to spread Islam, but in the triangle of evil, they want to manipulate Muslims, to tell them that their duty as Muslims requires the establishment of a Muslim empire. I believe that Palestinians and the Israelis have a right to have their own land, but we have to have a peace agreement to assure the stability for everyone and to have normal relations. Wow, he just said Israel has a right to their own land. There was gunfire in the palace. A, an attempt was made at assassinating him. He went into hiding. Iran celebrated his death, and he came out of hiding, hating Iran and radical Muslims even more than he did before. But here it's very clear. Radical Muslims want a caliphate by forth, force, which is in Jerusalem, and the moderate ones are those that are opposed to it, and they are fighting a war to the death in many countries already. But then on May 14, 2018, the United States opens its embassy in Jerusalem, exactly 70 years to the day from the founding of the country of Israel. And this was... a. Uh, coin put out by the temple group and you'll notice the guy in the background is uh, Cyrus the Great after 70 years of captivity he says to Israel Jerusalem is yours and they rebuild the temple after 70 years of statehood Trump says Jerusalem is yours and this group believes that they will rebuild the temple and so they see Trump and Cyrus the Great as very similar characters Meanwhile, Iran puts out a picture. Trump had told Iran to be careful that they were going to suffer like nobody had ever suffered in history. And so they send out this picture. And you'll recognize the White House with an explosion going on. You'll see smoke coming out of uh, President Trump's quarters on the second floor. The U.S. flag is falling. And a man is standing there with a radio in his hand. This is Soleimani, the commander of the Al-Quds Force, the claims to have over a thousand terror cells in the United States. He's called for a strike on the White House and Trump himself was targeted basically because you can see smoke coming out of the second story windows. Now, when President Trump was in office, he, and before and after as well, whenever somebody threatens him, he tries to take them down. So you wouldn't want to be in Soleimani's shoes after this. Uh, but Iran is just showing that they're not afraid of the U.S. And matter of fact, uh, it says in English over on one, the left-hand side, we will crush the USA under our feet. Then the Pope goes to the uh, United Arab Emirates and makes an alliance with them. The meaning of the Pope's historic visit to the United Arab Emirates what has changed in brief is the dual rise of the Muslim Brotherhood in Islamic State. The following analysis applies equally to the Emirates and to Saudi Arabia. Facing direct challenges, the Gulf states calculated that they could no longer appease Islamists and should instead crush them. That is precisely what they have done both in the UAE and in Saudi Arabia. The institutional authorities of Islam and the political authorities with which they are aligned have just bought themselves an institutional ally, if not a theological one. Whether the alliance keeps the theological barbarians at bay is another question. Notice, the Pope goes to the United Arab Emirates and they make an alliance. And what comes of this alliance is shortly after the United Arab Emirates are the first ones to normalize relations with Israel in the Abrahamic Accords. While all this is happening and Muslim nations are joining with Israel, Iran puts out a picture. And in this picture you see that in the background, we have the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, Al-Quds. That is the focal point. You have ships across the picture that are on fire and sinking. And these are all flying American or Israeli flags. But you take a close look at this water. That's not water. That's a Palestinian headscarf. And 
The meaning of this picture is very clear. The Shiite Muslims are supporting Sunni Palestinians because they want to take Al-Quds or Jerusalem. And remember, the special forces in Iran are called the Al-Quds Brigade because they someday intend to take over Jerusalem and make it the capital of the Muslim world. Uh, meanwhile, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the caliph, was killed and he was replaced by Abdullah Kardish, who was now killed as well in February of 2022. Does that mean the king of the south is finished? No. They just named somebody else. And we have Iran, we have Al-Qaeda, we have Turkey and others all likely to do it. And the worst case scenario is that they end up working together and really expand uh, their influence and their power and the threat capabilities. Early in January 2020, uh, Soleimani was killed by a Trump-ordered drone strike and the Operation Martyr Soleimani was conducted by Iran. And at the moment that I took these headlines off the Drudge Report, uh, they were saying it's war. They thought it was war. Because Trump had said if the Iranians kill any American soldiers in their retaliation for the Soleimani killing, that Trump had already named 58 targets, one for each of the Jimmy Carter hostages in Iran during the Jimmy Carter years, and that those targets would include military, cultural, and religious targets in Iran. Which means, instead of it being typical war fashion, he's going more into a holy war fashion in response to Iran. Now, Iran did target U.S. troops and bases. And uh, they began attacking them. They called it fierce revenge. And it hit these bases, but all the Americans were able to get underground. Nobody was killed, but 50 to 100 of them got concussions. Not a minor I injury, but nobody died. And Trump's line had been, if you kill any Americans, he's going to wipe this out. We came that close. If one American would have died of those 50 to 100 that got concussions, Trump would have let loose based on what he said. And we would have had a war that could have easily gone into a globalized war. But it did not. And then we had things hit uh, and change here in our, around the world. Now, did that mean that the radical Muslims had given up? No. Jerusalem po Post uh, reports the following. A preacher up at the Alaska Mosque, up on the Dome of the Rock, uh, is talking about uh, Jerusalem being the capital of a global caliphate. This preacher, Siam, can be seen telling the enthusiastic crowd that three prophecies would soon be fulfilled, that the rightly guided caliphate will be established, that Jerusalem, Al-Quds, will be liberated and established as its capital, and that Islam would achieve world domination. So they haven't changed their viewpoint at all. It's still on. It's still what they're after, uh, just as Mohammed bin Salman from Saudi Arabia had said as well. Uh, then the Islamic State Caliphate starts taking over large chunks of Africa and, uh, as it did earlier uh, up north in Syria and Iraq. And these are brutal tactics, the Pentagon warns. For instance, uh, they capture and behead 50 men and boys on a Moz Mozambique football fi field or pitch before chopping them up and kidnapping every woman. These are things that happen on a fairly regular basis. Even though when COVID hit, most people quit hearing about radical Islam, the threat of radical Islam had not gone away. In France, the military keeps warning the civilian government that a civil war is brewing uh, because of radical Islam in the country. And in May of 2021, you had an 11-day missile shooting spree between uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians. The Palestinians started launching missiles and Israel hits back even harder. Uh, interesting at this point, uh, radical Muslims sided with the Palestinians, radical leftists around the world uh, sided with the Palestinians, and the moderate left around the world sided with uh, Israel and the moderate Muslims and moderate left both sided with Israel. 
And if you want to see more on that, take a look at our presentation called Time of the End Alliances. It was also interesting that when Soleimani, the commander of the Al-Quds Force, the Iranian Al-Quds Force was killed, the radical Muslims and the radical left were angry and the moderate Muslims and the moderate left were quietly happy. So this parallel between radical Islam and radical left is a very broad parallel and it's true over and over again in, in the presentation Time of the End Alliances and the role of politics, left-right politics and prophecy we go into that in detail. In Nigeria, the first 200 days of 2021 saw 3,362 Christians killed. Typically, two to 3,000 Christians are killed every year in Nigeria. But in those first 200 days, we had over 3,462 killed. In other words, I'm demonstrating that even though it disappeared off most people's television screens, when COVID came on the scene, it continued to go and has even ramped up in some areas. And then comes uh, Russia invading Ukraine and it continues uh, to be hidden in many ways. And most people aren't seeing what radical Islam continues to do. In August of 2021, the United States retreats out of Afghanistan and the fall of Afghanistan empowered radical Muslims, China, and the radical left around the world. But I want you to notice this headline. It says the Taliban's 20-year victorious alliance with China against the U.S. and the Uyghurs. Again, you have Marxist socialists and the politi political left united or allying with radical Islam. As I said, it happens often. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett says Iran seeks to dominate the region under a nuclear umbrella and he hints that Israel would act if the world does not. He said all red lines have been crossed and he said other, the rest of the world has the ability to ignore but Israel does not have that ability because it's their life on the line. So current political similarities around the world, the political right leans towards papal-led traditional Christianity that's Daniel 11 and Revelation 13. And in Daniel 11 and Revelation 11, the political left leans south or allies with radical Islam. And God's people always get caught in the middle. Now, it's not just my observation that this is happening. In uh, their About page, Crisis Magazine uh, in 2020 said the following, Not since the Cold War have we experienced such violent political, cultural, and spiritual unrest. Not since the Civil War has our country been divided so bitterly against itself. Our civilization is under attack from the far left within and radical Islam without. And so they see that double attack. Radical Islam and the radical left, both hitting them. In our world today, we're seeing some alliances. Russia attacking Ukraine, who is supported by China, North Korea, Iran, and Syria. That is um, the radical left, Marxist socialism, and radical Islam, the Islamist. The secular West is trying to use all of this to have a great new international control. You might call it the Great Reset. Meanwhile, papal-led Christianity is trying to take all of this turmoil and lead it to, for the world to end up following the papacy and traditional Christianity. So you have this mix. And basically what I see coming Radical Islam goes down, moderate Islam follows papal-led Christianity, and some of the secular world goes down and some of them follows papal-led Christianity. And with all the crisis going on, the papacy is, based on prophecy, the papacy will come out in an international religious control movement backed by the United States and traditional Christianity. Uh, you have the environment, you have COVID, you have Ukraine, you have oil and economy. All these things with, with what's going on in U the Ukrainian conflict, uh, food and oil are going to be major issues, uh, energy around the world. And in the Middle East, food, tremendous amount of the food and wheat for the Middle East, Lebanon, Egypt, places like that, comes out of Ukraine. So the Ukrainian conflict, the Russia's invasion there, could send shockwaves all the way through the Muslim world. 
So when we look at it, we have Islam and their allies attacking papal-led Christianity. Let's look at it again to see how it works. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Papal-led traditional Christianity comes under attack, and they have an overwhelming counterattack. Radical Islam, radical left overthrown. Moderate Islam, moderate left follows traditional Christianity and some escape and are delivered by Jesus Christ. We have, right here, we have Islam coming up and radical Islam in its third conflict and we have the political left coming out of the French Revolution. They come to have a defeat in 1990s from Ronald Reagan and John Paul II, but they resurge and they become allies also of the king of the south. That is followed by the greatest evangelistic opportunity of all time. But both Islam and the political left are under time pressure. They are not far from their goals, but at the same time, they don't have much time left uh, because you get political backlashes and they tend to overreach under pressure, which causes the backlash to come in even harder. And I'm expecting the political right and traditional Christianity to come back in. Now it says, Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape. That means delivered by Jesus Christ. Here's how I get that. Daniel 11, these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Daniel 12, 1, at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Now these are only just a couple of verses apart from each other. And uh, as I look at this, the word for escape and the word for delivered over here are the same word in Hebrew. So when we look at that, uh, these people that escape are the same ones that are de being delivered. So those delivered are delivered by Jesus coming. So there's going to be a group of Muslims, Edom, Moab, and Ammon, which are all Abrahamic family relatives, interestingly. And in the New Testament, any time I accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, I become a part of the Abrahamic family. The parallel statement in Revelation says, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life when they see the beast. Everybody's going to end up following the beast or in the Lamb's book of life. Edom, Moab, and Ammon don't follow and they're not overthrown, which means they have to be in the Lamb's book of life. Thessalonians says it, and they shall not escape, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Those who escape are those trusting in Jesus Christ. Amos 9, on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, uh, the Davidic king, which is Jesus at the end, which has fallen down and repair its damage and rebuild it as in the days of old that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. So Edom and the Gentiles are going to be called by his name. Now, take a look at a map. Here we have the Davidic kingdom. And it comes up and around and back down over here. And inside that line are Edom, Moab, and Ammon. Interesting. They're a part of the Davidic kingdom that are going to be called by his name. And in Daniel 11, Edom, Moab, and Ammon escape. Joel 2, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So based on this, right before Jesus returns, we can expect that there are going to be people having dreams and visions. And all across the Muslim world right now, we have people having dreams and visions by the tens and even hundreds of thousands of them are having dreams and visions of Isa, Jesus, the righteous one. And he comes to them and says they must trust in him for salvation and they must follow the Bible as their guide for life. I know people, I have a friend who runs a website that helps Muslim understand the dreams and visions because he, I mean, they do a search and it brings them to his website and he gets to tell them more about Jesus. And it's really exciting, the ministry he gets to do. I have another friend that has hundreds of thousands of Muslims in his underground network. And there are other networks besides his. But these are people that are following Jesus in the Bible that are coming out of Islam to do so. It's really exciting to watch all this happen. If Joel 2 is being fulfilled, 
At the same time, Daniel 11 is being fulfilled. And the allies of the king of the north and the king of the south are in place for this time of the end conflict. Then, friends, it tells me it is time to be ready to see Jesus Christ. It is time to surrender your life to him as your Lord and your Savior. He forgives your sins. You don't have to worry about how you're going to be spending eternity because you'll be spending it with him as long as you continue to trust in him. And you follow his word, the Bible, as, as the authority for your life. You follow it no matter what. Yes, you might get caught in the middle. You might have radical Islam on one side and traditional Christianity on the other side, but you're following Jesus in the Bible. Jesus knows what it's like. In Daniel eleven twenty two. He was caught in the middle. He died in the middle. Verse 22 is the middle of the prophecy. And then throughout the rest of the book, he is there with his people in the middle. And at the end, he rescues his people in the middle. And friends, I have talked to Muslims all over the world that have had these dreams and visions. And you know, it's exciting to see. Two-thirds of Muslims that become followers of Jesus, it is estimated, have had a dream or a vision leading them to do so. And I mean, some of these visions are just so specific, even telling names of people they're supposed to meet, who they're supposed to go see, ask questions to. Um, these are not stories that you can share in great detail because of the, these people are still living in Muslim areas. These are ministries in Muslim areas. And it's a deadly serious situation that radical Muslims find out they will kill you. But I'm just here to tell you, it's all happening. And there's a group of Muslims that are choosing to follow Jesus in the Bible. And there are Christians who also are following Jesus in the Bible. There's an inter interesting uh, Muslim saying, supposedly from Muhammad. The Jews were divided into 71 sects, one of which is in paradise and 70 are in the fire. The Christians were divided into 72 sects, 71 of which are in the fire and one in paradise. My umna or Islam will be divided into 73 sects, one of which will be in paradise and 72 will be in the fire. So it's interesting. Even in these hadiths, we find that there is a teaching that there will be a small number of Muslims that join a small number of Christians and others who truly follow God. Well, friends, before Muhammad ever thought of writing it a thousand years earlier, God had had Daniel give the specifics of Daniel 11 that Edom, Moab, and Ammon would follow Jesus and be delivered by Jesus. That's a small part of Islam and a small part of Christianity would join with them, a remnant that had come out of Babylon, the king of the north in Revelation 18. So what should a Christian do? Well, you're not, you shouldn't follow Islam. You shouldn't follow papal-led traditional Christianity. You should love people on both sides. You need to not follow the political left or the political right. You need to be following people on both sides. And you need to be serious about following Jesus in the Bible. Because we are getting very, very close to the coming of Jesus. And just like Jerusalem gets caught in the middle, God's people of faith will be caught in the middle as well. Romans 13 tells us, Now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It's time to wake up. Make Jesus and his word, the Bible, the center of your life. You don't need to be fearful. Jesus wins. And if you're with him, you win as well. The king of the south goes down, the king of the north goes down, but those who love Jesus and others that get caught in the middle, will survive with Jesus. What happens next? That's what we look at in the next presentation, which is entitled, Tidings from the East and the Mark of the Beast. I look forward to you being a part of that with us.